I'm going to speak Russian for the introduction. The lecture itself will be in English, and questions and answers may be made in both languages. But I will say in Russian, then the lecture itself will be in English, and the questions can be asked in any of the available languages. But for those who need the translation, please do so now. Take the earphones because they are required. Both languages are required. Добрый день! Я очень рад приветствовать всех на нашей очередной лекции, которую Всемирный банк любезно организовал в рамках нашей серии. Название лекции «Прогнозирование бедности в Кыргызстане. Иерархический подход». Ну, вы знаете, что проблема бедности и ее сокращения она остается существенной для нашей республики, так что тема прогнозирования бедности – имеет очень большой, вызывает очень большой интерес. А позвольте мне представить наших э, докладчиков. Значит, это госпожа Мария Грация, Грация Питау, она профессор экономической статистики из университета Сапиенса в Гриме, Италии. Она имеет большой опыт научных исследований в разных э, академических учреждениях, включая Колумбийский университет в Нью-Йорке, включая исследовательские центры в Люксембурге, в Барселоне и в других местах. У нее есть степень доктора наук по экономике. А второй наш докладчик это господин Роберт Земли, он тоже профессор экономической статистики в университете Сапиенса в Риме, в том же самом университете. И он имеет похожую биографию как исследователь. Работал в разных исследовательских институтах, много публикуется, тоже доктор наук по экономике, и они оба являются консультантами Всемирного банка, они проводят исследования по заказу Всемирного банка, и они проводили обучение для специалистов Национального статистического комитета и Министерства экономики Кыргызской республики, так что они как уже знакомы с ситуацией в нашей стране. Есть еще третий автор, госпожа Сейда Ислава Конова, который является старшим экономистом Всемирного банка в здешнем офисе Всемирного банка, но сейчас ее нет с нами. Значит, позвольте мне объяснить вам регламент. Лекция займет 40-50, что-нибудь такое, минут. Потом у нас будет время для вопросов и ответов. Значит, в ходе лекции... Просьба задавать вопросы, только если какой-то горящий вопрос на уточнение. Да? Что-то совсем вы потеряли с ним, непонятно, что имеется в виду. В таком случае, пожалуйста, поднимайте, можно будет задать вопрос. Если у вас более глубокий вопрос или комментарий, что приветствуем, то, пожалуйста, дождитесь окончания лекции. У нас будет достаточно времени, порядка часа для того, чтобы эти самые все вопросы задать и выяснить. Если вопросов нет по ведению, я хочу попросить, во-первых, всех выключить мобильные телефоны или перевести их в тихий режим, чтобы они нам не мешали. И с этим я позвольте мне передать слово господину Роберту Зерли, который начнет. I apologize first because I cannot speak Russian, any Russian, so uh, I'm sorry, I have to, we have to go on with English, and uh, right, and uh, let's go directly to the topic because this is a project <coughs> that was built uh, together with the World Bank and the Ministry of, of Economy because the Ministry of Economy had <clears throat> the need to have some predictions of poverty and the poverty rate across regions uh, and in the country. Uh, some uh, predictions, some forecasts that could be compatible also with the macroeconomic forecasts that the uh, Ministry of Economy provides. Um, so, 
For this reason, the availability of poverty predictions complements macroeconomic short-term forecasts like the GDP growth, like the employment or the unemployment rate, inflation, and so on, and uh, serve to promote the importance of distribution of issues as well when, uh, uh, when we have to assess current and economic and social developments. So uh, not only look at the economic performance in terms of per capita GDP, uh, of, of growth of the economy, but also in terms of allegation of poverty. And this, one, this is one of the uh, sustainable development goals of the country. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> let's start with the literature. And uh, uh, what about the, the literature? Uh, there is a large body of literature, of course, that over the world, over the, across the countries, has investigated the main factors that influence the poverty at risk of the households. Uh, which is the, 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 the point? The point is that for a given household, the probability of the household to be poor is conditioned by the extent and the participation of the members of the household in the labor market. Um, so the earning capabilities of the household depends on the capacity of the members of the household, mem household members to be uh, in the labor market. Um, and this participation, of course, is in turn conditioned on some inherent characteristics of the households itself. What kind of characteristics? Basically, economic characteristics, uh, uh, like uh, the, the capacity to work, for instance. Uh, demographic characteristics, the age of the members, the age of the household head, uh, the gender, and so on, and, so on. Uh, and social characteristics of the household. Uh, basically, level of education for the members of the household, and so on. Uh, so, economic, demographic, and let's say human capital attributes of the household. But generally, these studies on poverty, I mean, the models that we have uh, to predict poverty are based on this micro level uh, data. That is, according to the characteristics of the household, and less uh, based on the environment where the household lives. Uh, if you live in Bishkek, you have different opportunities than living in uh, Chui or in Isiku or in Osh or Osh City. Uh, so uh, we discussed with Saida, uh, the World Bank, and uh, the uh, Department uh, of uh, Economic Development of uh, the Ministry of Economy to check if it was possible, given the characteristics of the household, to verify if there is an impact on the poverty status of each family uh, due to some macroeconomic aggregates that we can, that the ministry can control. Uh, and these macroeconomic variables can be a regional level, let's say an oblast level. Okay. Uh, so we, we know which is the GDP, GDP or the GDP per capita at regional level, gross regional, gross regional product. Um, we know the unemployment rate at regional level, the amount of investments and so on. Given the characteristics of the household that they live in the office, can we estimate the impact of some changes in macroeconomic variables on the probability of being poor of those households, 
So this was the main question, the research question of our, of our project. Um, actually, uh, there are many ways to, to do that, but the international practices now is moving towards some, um, we call it integrated models that combine macroeconomic variables, or macro variables, macro data, with micro data at household level or individual level. And this combination of the two can be modeled uh, with hierarchical models, also called multi-level models. Okay? Um, I would like to quote also, I would like to quote also uh, this economist, Bourguignon. Uh, Bourguignon was a chief economist of the World Bank, and he recently considered, said that the appropriate approach to uh, evaluate the impact of macroeconomic policies and shocks on poverty should be to combine macro and micro models. So this is the this is the uh, our approach. Um, we are statisticians, basically, so we follow a statistical approach. So we model this with a statistical pro uh, approach, and uh, we have poverty measured at individual level, at household level, uh, but some variables that can help understanding the difference between households are available at regional, at almost level. Uh, so we use both variables, household level, aggregate level, as predictors of poverty. Uh, so the structure of our data is simple in the sense that we have households, which is our first level of observations, but households are nested in another level of observations, which is the oblast level. Okay? So we have two levels of data, individual and regional. Okay? So this is this is our model, and it's called multi-level model. Okay. Multi-level models have a long history in statistics. Uh, well, not so long, but 30 years, let, let's say 30 years. Um, and uh, they started uh, because uh, in the education literature, because they, uh, the problem was to evaluate the performance of the pupils, of the students, in different schools. So, how can evaluate a school according to the performances of the students? You cannot say, ah, the student is doing very well in one school, so that school is very good. Because it depends also on the characteristics of the student. If a school has bad students, bad students in terms of a very poor background, then they can improve a lot, but they will never be at the same level of another school who has very good students because they come from a very good background, very educated families that they can read when they have to because the house is full of books. So, <coughs> And this is why, this is why, uh, to, to, to do that, it, that, these hierarchical models were introduced. Hmm? Okay, so, what we are talking about? We are talking about poverty. So, let me briefly uh, re recall what, uh, how a household in the country is defined as poor according to the official statistics of the National Statistics Committee. So, <coughs> the, 
the poverty measurement uh, uh, applied by the National Statistical Committee uh, follows a so-called absolute approach. What is an absolute approach of poverty? An absolute approach of poverty is that uh, as a committee made by many people uh, of the government, and not only of the government, uh, decides a certain basket of goods that everybody should have. Basically food, but not only food. Hmm? And then they convert this basket of food into a monetary value. How much does it cost to buy that basket of food? The monetary value, that monetary value is called the poverty line. Okay? The poverty line. And uh, this national poverty line is estimated at least every five years because the basket of goods can change over time, uh, and of course adjusted for inflation every year. Okay? So the national poverty line allows, the, 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 the last one, a sufficient calorie requirement, 2,100 calories per day per person, plus a basket of non-food goods and services. Okay. There's a big discussion in all the countries about the, the limit, the boundary of this poverty line. And all members of a poor household are identified as poor. So there is no difference in inter-household uh, uh, difference, difference uh, um, in terms of poverty. And the poverty rate is the percentage of the population who live in poverty. That's it. That's the poverty rate. And uh, the last uh, figure of the poverty rate in the Kyrgyz Republic in uh, 2000 is in uh, uh, the poverty rate is 2017, and it was 25.6 percent. So one quarter of the population lives in poverty, according to the National Statistical Committee. Just to give you an idea. This is what we have done, just to show physically almost uh, what, what we are talking about. This is the distribution of per capita consumption of the households. In 2016, we use those data, um, in the country. Of course, according to a sample we are talking about. Uh, so this is the distribution, so low consumption, high per capita consumption. Okay? You can see there is a mass here of households that have uh, around 50, this is 50,000 sum per capita per year mm -hmm. in 2016. Right, that's the average consumption is there. Of course, there are house families that consume much more, 100,000, 150, 200,000, very few. And there are few households here, out of the screen. Well, one million, two million, but very few families. And then, we, we, we don't talk about this. We talk about the left part of the, uh, of the distribution because those people here consume very little. They consume per capita a year in 2016 less than 31,000 songs. Hmm? This red line we draw it is the poverty line. Okay? So those group of people are the poor, are defined as poor. Hmm? Say that all this day now that the consumption is regional dependent. Oh yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, sorry. 
this per capita consumption is also regional, uh, regionally deflated, uh, in the sense that uh, the difference in the cost of living in the different oblasts and also within the oblast between rural area and urban area is taken into account. Okay? So the measure is quite precise. Okay, that's the measurement. So now something about the forecasting model. Um, what we are going to predict. We are going to predict if a household is poor or not poor. So, uh, we have to predict a variable. Let me say, let me say this, which is zero if you are not poor, or one if you are poor. So, what you are going to predict is not zero one, but you are going to predict the probability of each household to be zero or one. Okay? And in order to do that, you cannot use a simple linear regression model. You have to use what is called in econometrics a logistic regression model that is a model that basically Like this, like this, you have zero, you have one, you have people poor, you have people not poor. This variable is a predictor, but then you have, you need to fit a model which is more or less like this. Hmm? So, let's say this variable is education, let's assume it's continuous, low, low education, no, no, the other way around, eh? years of education, okay, years of education, but the variable should be so, yeah. the other way around, eh? Yeah? <laughs> exactly. If this is years of education, it should be the other way down. No? So, you observed people here, also here, you observed people here. Okay? Yeah. Zero, 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 this is zero. Okay? But, it should be like this. Low years, few years of education, high probability of being poor, but then, when you increase the number of years of education, the probability of being poor declines. Hmm? Okay, this is just for one variable. Hmm? But this is the logistic, the logistic <coughs> regression model. And the model, the model actually, given certain characteristics, predicts, predicts this one. The probability of being poor of a household or of an individual which has this level of the variable, the predictor variable x, this number of years of education. Okay. Right. Your turn. What did you say, you know, the choice was between uh, the, the choice was, no, wait for me. The choice was uh, at the very beginning of the project uh, predict uh, the poverty status, uh, or rather, if you could go back uh, to the consumption distribution, or predicting uh, the consumption uh, for each household. So, so we discussed a lot about that. Uh, and uh, sorry. And at the very end, uh, we decided that predicting the probability of being poor. Grazie. Well, excuse me. Sorry. Can you speak to, to the microphone? Uh, 
I don't need this, right? Predicting the probability. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So we could have predicted the consumption for each household so instead of predicting the probability of being poor. So we discussed a lot about that. Uh, but the problem of predicting consumption, of course, it was easy in terms of econometric models uh, because we could have been used uh, a linear, uh, hierarchical, but linear models uh, instead of having a logistic model. Predicting probability has a shortcut uh, has uh, to be done uh, with a more complicated model. But at the same time, uh, if we want to predict consumption, we need to update the poverty line. And uh, it could have been much more complicated, and uh, in some sense, uh, you need to assume, uh, you need some assumptions, uh, that, uh, and you never know if they are good or not. So that's why we ended up predicting poverty status instead of household consumption. Okay, I. I try to give you, this is the more technical part, so interrupt me if I'm not clear. We are not going, sorry again for not speaking any Russian. Yes, this is really terrible, but uh, you know, we are getting old and not be able to learn another language. So I feel very uncomfortable and sorry, but that's the situation. So I'm not going into the details of the technical model, uh, but I'll try to give you an idea how to fit the model and how challenging it is to fit uh, such a complicated model, especially when we want to have at uh, the same time different levels uh, of variation in the model. So as Roberto was saying, uh, we have uh, this situation uh, and we have data from the National Statistical Office, the data for your country. For each household, we have a variable that has zero ones. So zero if uh, it's not poor. So for each household in the sample, we have a situation like this. These are the households. So this is the first, the second, the first household that is in the sample. And we have uh, the poverty status, poor or not poor. That is a binary variable, one zero, one one, zero zero zero. So based on that variable, the National Statistical Office estimates uh, the national poverty line. So we observed zero one, and we also observed the area, the oblast, where the households reside. We go into the details of the data set, but just to give you an idea on how we were in some sense forced to estimate such a model. So we observe 0, 1, and then we have many predictors at different level, years of education of the household head, number of people in the household, um, university degree or not, um, and other things, remittances, for example. Um, assistance from the government and other variables. But our uh, is called outcome econometrics in statistics, the depend variable, the target variable, what we want to predict is a variable that has values that are only zero one. So mathematically speaking, you need something that comprises the outcome to be confined in zero in a zero one interval. So if you use a linear model, a general linear model, you are not sure if the outcome it is between zero one. It can be it can be three point five. How can you interpret a probability if it is three point five? Just it doesn't exist. So we need a to go to a more complicated model and to have a situation like that in which we were able to predict not 0, 1, but the probability of being poor. So if you predict a probability of 0 0.8, for example, and you observed 1 in the data, you are pretty sure to have done a good job because uh, we can approximate 0 0.8 to 1. So when we compare 
the observed data with the estimated data, we are pretty sure that the model did a good job. And here we have other probabilities, so let's say 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and so on. So this is, uh, this is called the logistic regression model. And logistic because it's the function, the leak function, that ensure us to go from a linear framework, from a linear world, now years of education can assume any value within a certain interval. So it is a numerical variable. And the link function ensures us to go from the numerical world, from the numerical framework, to a zero, one interval. This function is the logistic function. So the name logistic model comes from the logistic function. That is a link function that maps continuous values into probability values. So the outcome is this one. And then we approximate in the usual way. So if the estimated probability is greater than 0 0.5, we have one, we estimated one. If it's 0 0.7, we estimated one. If it's 0 0.02, we estimated zero. Of course, we can make a mistake. If we estimate here 0 0.55, the rule says that this is one, but we observe zero. So this is the basic principle how this logistic model works. So there is a function, mathematical function, that maps continuous values into probability values. So we estimated, and this is the function, as I said, I don't want to go into the questions, but I want to give you, unless you are interested in that, but we can do later, but just to give you the idea of how we estimated the poverty rate. And we have many called predictors, many variables that we observed at household level that can influence, that can have an impact on the probability status. So which is the role of education, for example, or big house. We cannot use, uh, I don't know if you are familiar or not with econometric problems, but one of the economic problems, very important economic problem here, is that we cannot use income in the model because of the so-called endogeneity problem. So we need other variables that are proxies of income. For example, housing condition. If you live in a villa, if you live in a very nice area, if you have a lot of rooms and three bathrooms in your household, this is a proxy of your income. Education is a proxy of your income because the more educated you are, the easier it is for you to get a good job. And a good job implies high income. So we included all, sometimes, not the really open, but we included all these predictors that are proxies of income, but it's not income. Because do not forget that poverty status, as Roberto said, is based on consumption. So we cannot have income and consumption in the same model. So we have uh, all of these uh, things uh, are uh, the predictors uh, at household level. So number of people in the family, of course, big families are expected to have uh, higher probability of being poor than small families. Uh, number of rooms, uh, meter square, availability of durables, uh, and all the stuff that we could find into the integrated household survey in the country. So this is, uh, mm, so the, the, the model is done this. This is the probability of being poor. So the variable poor equal to one. And uh, the logistic function, that is the inverse of logistic function, the, this is a combination, a linear combination of the predictors. So for who is familiar, with the regression model, inside 
this function, there is nothing else than the linear combination of the predictors. So let's suppose not having this function, it is just a simple linear model. But if we use a linear model, we are not sure to get values between 0 and 1. So we need this linking function. But otherwise, uh, it's exactly the linear model. So every, all the um, variables that we have here is a linear combination of the predictors. For example, number of keys in the household, household size, number of rooms, uh, level of education, gender of education, a, um, sorry, gender of the household heads, education of the household heads, age of the household heads, because the survey is at household level. We also included, for example, number of number, the, number, the total number of employed people inside the households. Because if, uh, you know, if there is a couple and both work, uh, it's one thing. If there is a couple and only one person work, it's another thing. So all these uh, predictors uh, are here. And this is uh, the traditional logistic regression model. So actually the project and what we were asked to do is the following. Do all, all the households have the same probability of being poor independently where they live? Or maybe there are some contextual variables that can shape poverty rates among the different regions in the country. Two families, families, two households, similar in all the characteristics, so let's say same age for the household heads, same number of kids, same members in the household, same uh, characteristic of, characteristics of the house where they live, two different households, similar characteristics, but one household live in Bishkek and the other one uh, live in the rural area of Isikul. Do they have the same chance of being poor or not? We were asked to test this. So what we have done is to move from a simple logistic regression model to a more sophisticated regression model that is the hierarchical regression model in which we have, uh, let me give you just uh, an intuition. Let's go back to everybody more or less is familiar with the regression models. So, so if, I do some, if I do something with the regression model, everybody can follow. So let's suppose for a point that we are predicting consumption instead of poverty status. And uh, we have here the, the number of years of education. So, as Roberto said, there is a negative, re negative relationship between the number of years of education and uh, consumption, in the sense that, no, sorry, the, the poverty status. So, we have this relationship because the more educated you are, the richer you are, so maybe you consume more, but the relation is uh, positive. So we want to take into account uh, <coughs> the residential area of the household. So we are assuming uh, in some sense uh, that uh, based on where you live, uh, the fact uh, of education on consumption is different. So instead of having only one line, we can have different lines. Say, look, look this is the fitted model for the people that live in Isipul, while this is the fitted line for households that live in Bishkek Oblast. <coughs> and they are different. They are parallel, but they are different. So if you don't, if you are not educated, so if you have, if you are illiterate, if you have zero years of education, your consumption is low, but it's lower 
if you live in Isipul than if you live in Bishkek. So, the intercept, because these are the intercept, vary according to the regions where people live. So this is called a varying intercept model because it takes into account the fact that people reside in different areas. And this is how we do this. So we put in the model alpha j i in bracket because this, there are j, in our case 9, because the number of oblasts is 9, so we have 9 lines that So in our case, uh, it's like this, because it's the logistic function. Okay, but we have nine lines, one for each oblast. Okay, so this is the first step forward. So we are considering the residential area of the households. And then we ask another question, and the question is the following. Let's go back for a while, for a moment here, because it's easier to get the idea. Do education level have the same effect on income in all the areas? Because here, if you look at this uh, picture, the lines are parallel. So when you look at the beta coefficient of the model, the beta coefficient is this if I live in Isipur. But if I live in Bishkek, the beta coefficient, that is uh, the, um, the slope, uh, is still the same. Because uh, these lines are parallel. So the intercept vary, but beta, all the betas, uh, the beta is just one because these lines are parallel. So if we look at the derivative, and if we calculate the derivative of all these curves, the beta is always the same, because they are parallel. Why assuming they're parallel? There are different opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely. We are in both, at the very beginning, it's just to give you an idea. Absolutely, why they have to be, good question, why they have to be parallel? Why we don't allow them to be different? And if we have different lines, we can say that the effect of education on consumption, on earnings, for example, is a better example, is different. Because, for example, if you live in Bishkek, it's easier to go to university, other things equal, than if you live in a remote place near the lake. So this means uh, that these lines uh, are not uh, parallel anymore, but we can have uh, see a situation like that. So the effect is different, uh, and it differs uh, among the nine oblasts. And so we have this model. We have varying intercept and very slow, varying slopes. So, for example, in the logistic irrigation model, they are not parallel anymore, but we can have this line and, for example, that line. This is what uh, we, we are trying to do. And the other thing is, okay, we found that the effect of education on earnings is different among the regions. Can we explain this difference? Are there any macro variable, variables, contextual variables that can explain this difference? For example, access to universities. If there was a train for easy pool every day and in 10 minutes, in the 10 minutes, in one hour, from the easy pool area to Bishkek, you could have got, um, used this train to go to university, maybe. Many students from Isipul were more prone 
to attend classes in university. So, which variables we have at regional level? We have the per capita GDP that can be a potential predictor to explain this variability between regions and the unemployment rate or investment. Or we also have the share of remittances. So we have different variables, at contextual variables at oblast level that could help us to understand, to explain these differences between the oblast inside the country. So this is the idea. But let me say that it's not easy to estimate this model. It's complicated, it's written in this way. So here, these uh, nice equations, uh, they say just one thing. Look, uh, these are uh, the intercept and these are the slopes. Uh, and intercept and slopes uh, depend on uh, this uh, capital U. And this capital U are the macro variables. So for example, if I live in a region, uh, let's suppose that UJ is uh, unemployment rate in a region. So if I live in a region with a higher probability, um, higher unemployment rate, the pro and that if I'm unemployed, the probability of finding a job is less than if I live in another oblast with a lower unemployment rate. So the probability of being poor is negatively affected by the unemployment rate in the country. And this is written in these equations. So estimating this model was, you know, this, are, this is all the econometrics and the mathematical stuff that is beyond the model. So as I promised, I don't want to go into these details because, you know, nobody's interested and it doesn't help to understand the main goal of the topic. But it wasn't challenging. It wasn't challenging for many reasons, and especially because we have a very, let's say, technical problem. And I want to explain you the technical problem, and we had to move to the Bayesian analysis for those who know about something about Bayesian econometrics. Because we have nine oblasts, and we want to at least per capita GDP and unemployment rate uh, as uh, contextual variables, uh, and if it could possible, even uh, a relationship between micro and macro data, which is the relationship, the interaction. And if I'm unemployed, and being unemployed uh, is a characteristic at household level, being unemployed uh, in an area with a high unemployment rate uh, is one thing. Being unemployed in an area with a low unemployment rate, it's another thing. So I'm combining micro data, being un be employed or unemployed, that refers to the individual, to the level of unemployment in the area. So I'm interacting two predictors that are defined in different levels. Household level the first, oblast level the second. <coughs> This mean, means interacting micro and macro predictors. So we want two, at least two macro variables because you know per capita GDP is the most important variable probably, but also unemployment rate because unemployment rate refers to individuals, affect directly earnings. So we want these two variables and the interaction between we decide we did two different models education and per capita GDP, household, household head education, and household level employment status and unemployment rate. But uh, we have only nine oblasts. So at the second level of variation, it's like to fit a regression model, fit a model with nine units, with nine data. So it was really challenging and only Bayesian analysis allowed us to estimate such a model because we had to 
push in some sense our estimates uh, towards uh, a value of the likelihood. So this is the technical problem that we had to solve. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you want to do policy, the government, I'm finishing, so, the government want to, um, the only way uh, for the government to do something is move the macro variables. It cannot give you 10 years more of uh, education. On, it cannot give you, oh, I don't know, one people that work in the household. But in ca it can increase, for example, investment in schools. Or it's a, you can say, if the per capita GDP in the area will grow of 2% next year, how this increase will affect the poverty rate of the people. But I cannot say if I could give you three more years of education, because education is a, you know, a matter of choice. So the only variable that we can predict and we can play with are the contextual variables. So in terms of policy implications, in terms of predicting poverty rates, it was really important to have these macro variables in the model. Okay, so I hope it was clear, at least the principle was clear. And, uh, So, so, so Grazia explained this model, that is, once we have to select the predictors or the variables that can influence at micro level and macro level, we have to estimate the model, and Grazia told, told you that it's not easy to estimate a model with such a number of parameters, that either parameters we call the Bayesian framework. Uh, but then we estimate a model for one year. Then we can forecast how. Okay. We can we have some macroeconomic forecast about GDP and employment rate and so on that we can use in the model. We can micro simulate some household level variables like, for instance, maybe the amount of remittances from abroad, based on certain characteristics. So, with new inputs on the estimated model, the output is the forecast in terms of the probability of being poor of each household. And then, given the probability of being poor of each household, using the sampling weights, we can forecast the poverty rates at oblast level. So that's the structure of our, of our model. Um, data. Microdata comes from the country integrated household uh, budget and level force survey. It's a survey conducted by the National Statistical Committee, KIHS. Um, it covers around 5,000 households in the country, so around 20,000 people, um, divided into strata. Strata, that is the oblast, the seven oblasts, urban and rural, and then the city of Bishkek and Ocean City that are considered two different regions. Okay? The structure of the questionnaire is extremely rich, complex, because it, uh, 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 the households were asked about their behavior in terms of education, migration, their health condition, there is a section specific on women, and then this is the labor force survey, which is integrated in this survey as well, um, about employment and unemployment, and then consumption of food, 
non-food income and house and, and ownership, property and housing conditions. Housing conditions, ownership of durable goods, li, li, um, land plot, and, and livestock, and so on. So it's a, we were quite amazed because it's a re, really detailed questionnaire. And uh, we were quite amazed by the fact that there is not such an attrition. I mean, that not many households decided not to answer. Because if, if we have a questionnaire like this in Italy, and we, we, we talked about with our National Statistical Office about it, I think more than half of the people will refuse to fill this questionnaire because it's really demanding, time demanding. Okay. Uh, this is the core model. Of course, we have many other models, but uh, now we present the basic, the basic model that we have. We cannot present all the models, uh, not, not now, uh, at the moment. Um, anyway, at micro level, uh, in, we have different blocks of variables. Uh, as Grazia was saying, first of all, the exogenous income-related predictors, not income as a whole, but some uh, specific sources of income, like remittances and uh, social assistance benefits to the household. Some variables that concern demographics, age, gender, size, some socioeconomic predictors, like educational level, the number of members of the household employed, residents, and ownership of durable goods and access to services and houses conditions as a proxy of the standard of living of a household. Uh, ownership of an electric oven, a car, washing machine, electric stove, satellite antenna in the household, landline, landline access to internet, for instance, availability, availability of sewer services, number of rooms in the house. And of course, some variables at all those levels, like per capita GDP and employment rate. So this is the description of all the variables, type of variables in the, um, in the core model. Some descriptive statistics here. In 2016, according to the um, survey, 18.7% of the population, so weighted data, receive remittances from abroad. 12% of households. Um, and the average amount of per capita remittances was for poor families, 13,000 some, for not poor families, almost 30,000 some. Um, there is a percentage of households that receive social transfers. Uh, some social transfers are specific to alleviate poverty. 11.2% uh, of the total population received uh, in 2000 received in 2016 uh, social transfers. The average amount of these those benefits uh, are around 4,000. But for poor and not poor, I mean the transfers were benefited both categories of households. Poor households, not poor households. Okay. Uh, just one thing is always remember, I would like to remember that. Uh, poverty is based on per capita consumption. Just you have the total consumption of the household, and you divide this total consumption by the number of the members of the household. Okay? So there is no, uh, there are no economies of scale in, in in the definition of poverty, which is good for food, of course, but not for other goods. Or shelter, for instance. So this is an issue. <coughs> so we, 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 
it's still there. No? Uh, but uh, they, uh, we can introduce different measures of poverty in the country. Anyway, just to give you an example, I just give you this example because yeah. we're running out of time. Look at this. This, this is the household size of the household. And uh, those histograms represent the percentage of households who are not poor in light blue and poor in dark blue. Okay? And you can see that there are very few households, single member households who are poor. And very few with two members. But when you increase the number of members of the household, the number of households who are poor increase dramatically. So size matters. Okay, let's go. Ah, okay, another one. <coughs> Durable goods. Durable goods entering the model basically for two reasons. One reason is because they are instrument, they are proxy of the quality of life of a household, but also because if you have a durable, like a washing machine, the service of the durable, of this durable, like the laundry in this case, are accounted as consumption, are imputed consumption. So, for the fact that you have a washing machine, you increase your consumption. It's like if you have a house, you impute the rent that you would pay to yourself. And the rent is a consumption. So, the fact that you, have, that you own a house, you increase the consumption. This is a national account rule in every statistical offices. But you can see here, if you have a washing machine, here, you have a washing machine, the number of households who are poor, relatively speaking, are much less than the case you don't have a washing machine. So, uh, you, can, you cannot see here the relationship with the unemployment rate. No? No? Anyway, this is the poverty rate from 2006 and 2016 in the Kyrgyz Republic. You cannot see the other graph, but there is a sort of temporal correlation, cross-correlation with unemployment rate, but also with per capita GDP. The per capita GDP grows, but with the growth, not, not so much. So Please sorry, trust me. Can I just say one thing? Roberto is uh, uh, looking. Uh, Roberto is looking at this relationship because we he's trying to uh, let you understand why we included in the model one predictor, predictor instead of another one. So we he went into the relationship between poverty status. Uh, and uh, potential predictors uh, just to give you an idea how they how to select uh, potential predictors. So, but he will be back to the model. So, sorry, but just exactly. to... so this is a correlation across time, but we have also a correlation across space, so across oblasts. Uh, and based on this cross correlation, we selected the predictors initially. Okay, right. So these are these are plot of the estimated coefficients of the model. The coefficients of the model gives you more or less the impact of the of each predictor on the probability of being poor. And as you can see, you have um, some predictors that have a negative impact on 
being poor for the families. Uh, for instance, yeah, the number of employed people in the house. They, if you increase the number of employed people in the household, okay, since the coefficient is negative, so the impact is to reduce the probability of being poor. Very strong. More or less, those impacts, those effects, are comparable. So we normalized, we rescaled the predictors in order to compare the size of the coefficients. So they are comparable. And you can see that this effect is very large, but also there are other effects large, like durables, that, like the number of rooms, uh, we'll talk about this later, but um, the largest effect is the size of the house. The largest effect, by far. This is interesting because if the household head is female, only marginal, has a marginal impact in the country of being poor. So there is no gender effect, we would say. In the country, in terms of poverty, this is uh, this is uh, this is a good this is a good result because this does not happen in many European most of the European uh, countries, hmm? for sure not in ours. not in the US or not in the US. Anyway, where there is a large gender effect here, um, and then <coughs> unemployment. Of course, the unemployment rate has a huge impact on the probability of being poor for the households who live in that oblast. While the GDP effect is negative. So if you increase the GDP, the probability of being poor declines, no? which is intuitive. Um, there are a lot of interactions. This, I would like to show you this one interaction. This is, the action, this is the interaction between the unemployment rate and the area where you live, urban or rural. And the effect is negative. What does it mean? It means that, let's suppose that there is an increase of the unemployment rate in a oblast. Then if the unemployment rate increases, the probability of being, the chances of being poor increase as well. But differently if you live in an urban area or in a rural area. If you live in an urban area, the chances, the, the, the probability increases but less. And households who live in a rural area. Okay, this is just uh, the, what, roughly what I said. Uh, there are individual factors that negatively affect the probability of being poor, roughly in order of importance, share of the member, availability of washing machine, electric stove, educational level, number of rooms, remittances, and individual factors that positively affect the probability of being poor, size, basically, age, very little, gender, very little. And then there is a direct effect of macro variables in terms of GDP, unemployment, and the interaction that I was talking about. So, I'm finishing. Uh, these are the estimated probabilities of being poor. So, this is the histogram of the estimated probabilities. As you can see, there is a large fraction of the households that have very low probabilities of being poor and then declines towards one. Uh, this is some diagnostics of the model. Just to say that this is a core model. There is room for improvement. So the selection of the predictors can be improved. We can improve many other things. I mean, a model is not fixed forever. You can always change and improve a model. 
This is something that we always tell to our students. Um, okay, so in terms of forecast, just let me skip all this part. As I said, once you forecast the probability of being poor, you can forecast also the poverty rate with this formula, just using the weighted mean. Uh, with weights used in the sample, sample, and uh, right, this uh, estimates forecast actually of the national poverty rates over time that show a slow decline, slow decline of the poverty rates. <coughs> the, uh, and this is at regional level as well. There are huge differences at regional level, very huge differences at regional level. Also from one year to another one, you can have a look at the site of the National Statistical Committee. Um, but here, what, what, what I would say is that uh, our model predicts um, a, 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 a decline of the poverty rate, which is not big, despite the fact that the GDP growth, predicted GDP growth, is quite high. So pay attention because the growth of the GDP does not necessarily imply alleviation from poverty. Uh, the tide doesn't ride, rise all boats. As quoting the sentence of JFK. Mm -hmm. Right. So, combining micro and macroeconomic forecasts <coughs> is a challenging task, but I think that it's the appropriate tool of analysis to evaluate the impact of shocks, of macroeconomic shocks, over the distribution of poverty. Multi-level models are, according to us, flexible models that allow to introduce this different uh, source of variation at household level and oldest level. And of course, there are direction for improvement in the selection of the predictors, uh, in pooling cross-sectional service, and so on. That, but I hope that the Ministry of Economy <coughs> will have another tool of analysis that is not only about the macro <coughs> aggregates, but it can evaluate also through <coughs> micro models also the poverty of the country. Thank you.